and welcome back intrepid travelers to 80 days yes we're continuing our journey across the world around the world i should say <laughs> let's get back into it now we're waiting till tomorrow so we can get to baku hopefully then krasnovax on to merv then to kabul down to Karachi and hopefully to Colombo because there was a good trip there. Or if we can get a faster trip overland, I'd do that as well. We'll see how it goes across India. Yep, India's there. China. Okay, let's go. Oh, it's tomorrow that's departing. So that's hotel. We bought everything nice here. We need three bags, otherwise we're screwed again. <laughs> Ashtrakhan. With the last light of the evening, I made certain to repack and iron everything. I went out to explore. With the last light of the evening, I went out to explore a little, only to see a cheerful Afghan ragamuffin in a raging argument with a shopkeeper, from which I learned that merchants in Kieta will pay fantastic amounts for jars of crude oil from Baku. Buck. Oh, it's a little airship. Sweet. The Forlanini Hydrofoil. The Hydrofoil across the Caspian Sea was a small affair run by one Alexander Sedlov. A keener and more enthusiastic amateur sailor than I have ever encountered. This is your ship? I asked as we boarded and stowed the luggage away. He patted the side of the rail of the craft, which wobbled. An ex-military vessel my cousin acquired, he replied proudly. I used to be a clerk, but the lure of the waves took me by the throat and I have never let go, he demonstrated. He demonstrated with one hand around my neck. Now this is all I'll do. Never set foot on dry land. Sea legs are my only legs. I looked at his legs. I looked at his eyes. Legs. <laughs> but saw nothing unusual about them. Then he threw the switch on the engine and we hurled across the water. Literally hurled as though standing aboard a spinning discus as it leaves the athlete's hand. Whoosh. Converse. Greetings, Captain Sevlov. Hold on tight now. Buckle to Terran. You mentioned boats, I've been told. Oh, okay. Mm. Terran to... Banda? You can fly aboard the little beetle from Terran to Banda Abbas. Banda Abbas. What about this? Some buyers will pay well for accordions. New routes discovered. Baku Baku. The Hydrofoil's wind motion did not slow. I put my trust in Monsieur Sedlov as best I could, following the Miss, Miss, Monsieur Fogg's placid example, and we waited out the most grueling day. It's the suspension, Sedlov admitted finally. I think it's a little loose. And wait. Uh, by the second day, the broken suspension was all I could think about. None of us had enjoyed, enjoyed any sleep, and while Alexander kept his spirits alive with vodka laced coffee, <laughs> myself and Monsieur Fogg were out at our wits, and I tried to sleep, but obviously could not. After several hours, we came with sight of Baku, and we raised a ragged cheer as though we had survived a shipwreck. We put into land and all but ran for our lives. <laughs> Alright, market. Can we sell anything? Baku, baku. Kieta. Where's Kieta? Where's Kieta, Kieta? Kieta, Kieta. There. So Kabul, Kieta, Karachi. That might work. Let's check out the explore first. Good. That's what we wanted. Baku is a city founded upon oil. In the shadow of the Romani Tower, we watched a line of peasants operating a hand pump, extracting oil seemingly from the ground itself. 
They seemed poor, and yet each held black gold in their hands, though I could not believe all these peasants had someone to sell their oil to. Indeed, there could be no local market at all. I asked a passerby why they queued. The first patch of our land has been sold off, she answered gloomily. We are stockpiling before it becomes illegal to take from the oil well. Huh. As I walked away from the oil well, I felt curiously sticky, and later that evening I found a dark, shimmering tear in the corner of my eye. Oil spreads everywhere in Baku. So it leaves tomorrow. Departs tomorrow. Arrives tomorrow. 5 p.m. All right. Hotel. As night fell, I afforded my master. I went, yeah, let's give him a little extra TLC. Ensuring he had fresh tea with intention, he could have a comfortable night. Sweet. Let's depart. Caspian Ferry. I knew there'd be a crossing there. There had to be. By contrast to Sevlov's hydrophobe, the cross Caspian Ferry was like a plush cushioned carriage surrounded by all modern conveniences. We stood at the rail, watching the scenery slowly crawl past and enjoying the fresh, if chill, air. The landscape here is so wild and vast it is hard to believe it is inhabited, but of course almost everywhere is home to someone. Yes, that is true. Converse. What is your wish, master? Pespat, there you are. Krasnovox. Uh, money? Well, the quickest way to Astrakhan from here is through Ekaterinburg. Very good. Towards the end of the day, we puffed into sight of the fort and of Krasnovax, and it, if it welcomed us, a gun cracked a shell across the water. <laughs> Pew! There seem to be no departures today. We should explore a little. So when is it? leaving though. Two days. Gotcha. Tomorrow. Sweet. Oh no, I'm not paying 700 bucks for an extra day. Krasnovox was a military fort and little else. A few Turkmen peasants lived in its shadow in the manner of medieval serfs, but they were largely ignored by the occupying Russian forces. Yeah, let's ask to be allowed in. <laughs> Reasoning that we might be able to find somewhere to stay or perhaps something to eat, but we were soon disabused by both nations. The only point of real interest for us was the train station where a military train shipped Sara soldiers further east into Afghanistan. The whole line had been built to infuriate the Persian Empire, whose borders were not far, and the British too, who watched their northern frontier jealously. I was not a little worried about our welcome. I was, I, and attempted to find alternative transport, and attempted to find alternative transport, but came up with nothing apart from one Goat herd who offered me a cart ride to another village a few miles down the coast. I declined. I do not like goats. We would have no choice but to walk up to the station the next morning and try our luck. Spending a night in Krasnovax, we encounter a pleasant Russian soldier who spoke a little English and a little French. Let's see Russian accent. I am going for the weekend, he declared. Is it marvelous? Is it? Is it not? Where are you going? There is an airship transport going north to Ekaterinburg. I will be aboard. It is almost full. I had to beg for my seat. Etimu. On the borders, the man agreed. The air is cold, but the people are warm. Fly well. I wished him. He nodded and patted me on the shoulder before rushing away. Well, we got to stay another night. 
before going to bed. Uh, let's keep exploring. But found nothing of any great interest. Dang! Depart. Embark. We must consider our approach, Monsieur Fogg declared as we approached the station. It is imperative these men understand the importance of our mission. We must appeal to their honour, Monsieur Fogg nodded. Quite so, and that was the extent of our planning. He strode forward. I followed quickly in time to overhear Monsieur Fogg talking to the guard. You may be surprised by the presence of an Englishman in a Russian military fort, he was saying. Therefore, you must assume we are here on the highest authority. An extremely urgent business. But I have no papers, so you must also assume that our purpose is somewhat secret. Therefore, I rely on you to rely on my honor. He nodded and stepped back. The guard looked at him blankly. Um, Commandant, or no, the Commandant would have like a badge. I waited nervously, all too aware of the guard's pistol, but the fireman arm stayed in its holster. Open the gate! Monsieur Fogg added. The guard thought for a moment and clicked his heels and nodded. Thank you, Monsieur Fogg declared, and with that we boarded the train. Oh, I wasn't allowed on the train first. <laughs> That's funny. Let's see, Converse. Greetings, Lieutenant. What do you want, civilian Merv? I'm not sure why anyone would be interested in Merv. Where do we need to go? I think it was Izmir. Tehran? No. Herat, damn. <laughs> we sat in a compartment with Russian soldiers on either side of us, bolt upright, polishing their guns. I have rarely felt so out of place. Each man in uniform was twice my size. He could have killed me. I am sure in at least 33 different ways. Monsieur Fogg, on the other hand, merely read his paper. What do we know of our destination? I inquired of my master. Merv is a staging post on the border of the Afghan territory, he replied. However, there is rumor that line does not go to Merv at all. Monsieur Fogg turned his newspaper around to me, pointing here. The headline ran, Russian line to Merv, rumored to go elsewhere. Does it say where? To Harat? Monsieur Fogg replied. From there we may travel to Kabul. Aww. But I wanted Merv. I got stuff to sell in Merv. Fuck. Harat to Merv to Kabul. I heard the Daranas and Kijis united against the British expansionism. Harat to Merv, Harat to Merv. Aww. Take a bull? Yep, right. Sweet. From Kabul to Bandar Abbas. Well, it doesn't look like we're going to get to Merv, but we might be able to get to Kabul. <laughs> On our second day, the soldiers warmed to us quite suddenly, as though they had received a telegram instructing them to do so. I spoke to one about the routes ahead, and he was most candid, explaining that his father had helped to build the paved Grand Trunk Road that now ran from Kabul to Lahore and beyond. But wait till you see our cargo! I was intrigued but declined to be led away from Monsieur Fogg. Suspicious as I was, they might have some strange design upon a lone Englishman in these difficult times. You can see the walkers when they stride up the Pall Mall. The men laughed, I must say. I did not. Russia is pleasingly far from Britain, and I for one hope it stays that way. We arrived into Herat Station a few hours later and disembarked, waving farewell to our cheerful Russian comrades. <laughs> Alright, so, market, we have stuff to sell. 
Kabul Calcutta Agra well Kabul's pretty close so we'll definitely get that and we can sell that in Kabul accordion here wasn't it? yes doesn't look like we're needing the fur coat anymore All this. <laughs> oh, Merv. Hat. Right, so. I think I'm going to have to skip Merv and just go to Kabul. Then we might go through to Agra. Or I wanted to go down, didn't I? Although from Agra, I might be able to find my way down as well to Colombo. Or we could still go across China as well. So yeah, we still got a few paths we can take. Explore it is. Yeah, that doesn't look like a good road. <laughs> I am the good fortune to encounter the toy maker of Harad, one of the most famous artificers in the modern world. Ooh. His shop was airy and bright, the ceiling dripped with miniature copper gyrocopters, gyrocopters and clinking models of the solar system. His shelves were laden with dolls with fine copper wire hair and tiny wind-up gazelles and jointed little Sufi mystics which sang as they twirled. The toy makers smiled as my eyes widened in wonder. Greetings, toy maker. Welcome. I think you are new to Harat. Indeed, I am on a journey around the world. His hand closed into a fist. What for, eh? What for? <laughs> for the adventure. Yeah, let's go either win a wager for my master adventure, but I'd pick adventure. For adventure, I told him. I once travelled the world, he said, but now I cannot leave the borders of Persia, or I would be arrested. By whom? The Artificers Guild, he voiced, turned bitter, and he smiled at my surprise. I once broke faith with them, he said. I made destructive weapons of war to defend my Durian masters against the British Army's invasion in the Kush. Now, as you see, I make toys. His manner was so open and direct that I... Watched his eyes and saw a deep regret. That could never be undone. We are all pawns of players of the great game, he remarked. We can win, but only if we remove ourselves from the board. Oh, that's what he said. And if others do not remove themselves, I asked, sensing something sinister in his words. He smiled, a tired, toothy smile. I speak only for myself. I swore my hands would only make innocent creations. And so you see me now, I toy Mika. And is that enough for you? Ishe Alao, this is how I will be remembered, he said. Though he turned his face slightly added, if I had remembered at all. Do not apologize. He shook his head once sharply. Why apologize? My entire life is a long, terrible apology. I asked him for his assistance on our journey. He laughed and shook his head. How could I help? You are an artificer. You must know the secrets of this city. I am the only secret left in this city, he said, with a strange note of sadness. Perhaps you should head to Delhi. Sarvaka lives there. They say she has built herself a new airship even faster than the one she made for the Raj. You resent her for something? Delhi. We're going to Delhi then for that airship. <laughs> Amula Sarvaka aided her masters and is celebrated. I aided mine and my tale is told as a warning to young artificers. I am a morality tale and she is a hero. Yeah. 
she worked with a stronger power. The British Empire's power wanes, and the Persian alliance with the Ottomans makes us even stronger, he said in a manner of schoolteacher. Mark my words, young man. I took my leave from the toy maker, wondering if I had been too harsh. Do all men deserve contentment? Perhaps, perhaps I do not know. So, Delhi. We'll stop at Delhi then. We'll see what that airship is. Departs tomorrow. A hired palanquin. Oh, we're going to Kabul, that's right. Sunday. Wow, that's a long time. Departs in four days. Yeesh. Or I can get to Lahore Saturday. And that arrives Sunday. But I have bags for Kabul. I have lots of stuff for Kabul. Yeah, I've gotta wait. It sucks, but I gotta wait. Until departs in four days. Okay. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Alright. Hi, chill up. We stayed in a hotel in the shadow of the towering citadel, built on a spur of a rock like Noah's Ark. Breached far above the sea, it dominated the skyline, a symbol of Durrani authority in a city that had been once been the capital of the Persian Empire. As night fell, I was quite sure I saw rocket fire from the walls and up into the skies, but what it meant, I do not know. I want to go to the bank. We must visit the bank, Monsieur Fogg declared. You have additional funds? I am a gentleman. They would extend my credit if required. Put my entire fortune into a carpet bag under your supervision. I did not answer. I regarded the bank as we entered the manager. A well-dressed, calm gentleman who greeted us with warm disinterest. You wish... 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 To withdraw funds, we were told. I warn you, it may take some time. So we're leaving Sunday, so we'll get some more money tomorrow. We require 700 pounds, I said. The manager nodded. I will have to communicate with London first, of course. He apologised. I should have a reply tomorrow. It seems Monsieur Fogg remarked as we left. We have some time to dispose of. Alright, hotel it is. We made ourselves comfortable for the night, and I spent a few hours walking around, enjoying the sights and smells of this curious part of the world. And let's get our money. We returned to the bank at opening time to collect our funds, and then we were ready to proceed once more. Sweet. With what remained of the day I attended to, I engaged another guest in conversation to learn what we could, learning from some buyers that will pay well for geometric equipment from Kabul. I thanked her. Depart? No, wrong one. Tomorrow. As night fell, I attended to, I engaged another guest in conversation. To find out what I could, hearing from her that you could pick up carved animals in Wailata with a, worth a huge amount in Singapore. Hmm. Part. Let's go. A black metal horse reared from the prow of the Kamataj, a masterpiece of Ottoman style powered by the new type of Persian engine. Sweet. Converse. 
<laughs> Greetings, Monsieur Abaddon. Ah, the unfortunate passport. Good day. Kabul to Kabul. Kabul has changed hands many times in the years. Kabul, Delhi. Speaking of carriages, I understand there is a regular service by road from Panama City to Acapulco. Delhi, Agra. Rio de Janeiro. Ha, you must have confidence in yourself. That's what, that's what I... Alright. Buenos Aires. I don't know these names. <laughs> to Rio de Janeiro. We had our papers inspected by a Persian customs officer with a pair of magnificent extending spectacles made of polished brass and engraved with Farsi script. Along the arms, he inspected our documents while turning a small lever behind his ear. A pair of smoked glass lenses slipped over the clear ones and he inspected our documents once more. We are traveling around the world, I blurted, and he could nearly hear my master refrain from rolling his eyes. <laughs> oh well, it's none of my business, the official remarked, philosophically. Your papers are in good order, good luck with your travels, we repeated, much with the same experience with the British customs official a few hours later, and so we arrived in Kabul through, thoroughly inspected and officially stamped. Sweet. Sell. Sell. Chittagong. I don't know where Chittagong is. Tomorrow, 8 a.m. Sounds cool. Chittagong there. Yeah, we'll go to Delhi and see if we can find that airship tomorrow that we're talking about. That's probably a good idea. And that's it for today, people. We are in Kabul. We have made it a decent amount of length across the world so far. And I will see you next time. See ya!